15 plus 10. Let's go. Okay, black against Sultan from Azerbaijan. Okay, so E4, again, we've played quite a few things in the speedrun. Let's start with a Sicilian. Let's, uh, I'm in the mood for a combative game. Let's go for a Sicilian. Okay, knight c3. So knight c3 is the jumping off point for a bunch of different lines, right? You might recognize this as the introduction to the Grand Prix, but it's also just a very tricky move order kind of move because white on the next move can develop the other knight and then transition back to an open Sicilian with d4. So the way that you respond to the move knight c3 basically depends on which Sicilian you play against knight f3. And I'll explain that a little bit more after the game. The move that I have liked for a very long time with black is actually the early a6 variation. This is not the most common move. Most people here go knight c6 or they go d6. But a6, in my opinion, is very, very underrated because if you're a knight or flare, this move makes a lot of sense. But even if you're not a knight or flare, it's a good way to combat the Grand Prix attack and the close Sicilian. Basically, the point is that you go for an early b5. You expand on the queen side quickly and early. And, of course, you get for yourself a nice development square for your light squared bishop. So we're going to play bishop b7, fianchetto, and then we're going to work on the king side. So bishop g2, how, do we, how exactly do we position our pieces here? So I'm going to put together a setup that I was taught many years ago. Now, if you play the Sicilian regularly, you should know that these two pawns, e7 and d7, often go on d6 and e6, creating what's more, not exactly, but kind of like the uh, Scheveningen pawn structure. And the reason you do that is because those pawns control a lot of very important center squares. It looks passive, but in reality, it's, it's part of the heart and soul of the Sicilian. So we can start with knight f6. We're not fearing e5 because the bishop on g2 hangs. Yeah, we can start with knight f6. We can start with d6. We can even start with e6. I like the concept of starting with either d6 or e6 for maximum flexibility. Let's start with d6. Let's play d6. The other benefit of the move d6, of course, is that it creates a potential development square uh, for the other knight on d7. And in, in such positions, the knight actually often goes to d7 and not c6 because developing the knight to c6 kind of blocks in the bishop uh, in kind of an awkward way. Okay, so now we can go e6 or we can go knight f6. I think it really doesn't matter all that much. Let's play e6 in the, sort of in the spirit of the variation. Hopefully it makes sense like why we're positioning these pawns on d6 and e6. Also, it creates breathing room for our kingside pieces. Now we can actually get the bishop out. Yeah, f4. Okay, now, finally, I think the time has come for us to begin to begin our development, knight f6. The other th thing that we often do in this variation is we position the queen on c7. We position the queen on c7. Um, let's, before we do that, before we do that, let's get our bishop out. Let's get our bishop out to e7 just to prepare to castle. White castles. And... This actually is already a good time to play the move queen c7. So queen c7 is basically, I would say, played for three reasons. The first is, of course, the fact that it potentially coordinates the rooks. Like after we develop the knight, we castle, the rooks are connected. The second is that in conjunction with the knight on d7, both of these pieces control the e5 square, making it harder for white to break through in the center with e4, e5. Otherwise, a very nasty idea in such positions. And the third reason is that... Um, what is the third reason? So it controls e5, it connects the rooks... And I guess it's just like it's just better placed on c7 than on d than on d8. Um, it, it, it's it's more prepared for the action. So we can play queen c7, can play knight bd7. I think that starting with a developing move makes more sense than starting with a queen move. This is more flexible because we know that we're going to want to play this move anyway. H3. So white is preparing kingside expansion with g4. That's fine. That does not disturb us. Let's go queen c7. Yeah, reason number three is actually reason number one and two combined. So you might kind of notice some parallels between the setup that we have decided on and the hedgehog or maybe the hippo. And the reason you are, are noticing that is because I think these pawns on e6 and d6 create that idea that it's similar to the hippo. But in reality, it's its, its own thing. Knight e2. Now we can choose which side to castle. Castling queenside is incredibly risky in such positions because... These two pawns can serve as hooks. White can use them to open up files very easily on the queen side. 
Whereas castling kingside is definitely safer in such positions. But that doesn't mean that we can never castle queenside. Now, it would be very interesting here, I think, to prevent white from playing g4. So I think we're going to make a very risky move, but hopefully a move that throws our opponent off just a little bit. We are going to play h5. And for now, we're going to keep our king in the center. For now, we're going to keep our king in the center. Now, I'm not that, I wasn't that scared of g4, but I want to see how our opponent reacts to this move. We're going to try to be as annoying as possible with the move h5. It's risky because now castling kingside is going to be involved with a tremendous amount of risk. So maybe we actually will end up castling queenside and, you know, basically telling white, come to papa. Come at me, bro. a4. But a4 might be a little bit premature. How should we respond to this? What should black do here? The move is pretty straightforward. Yeah, we should play b4. We should try to keep the queen side closed, especially because we are already kind of... Uh, our intuition is heavily pointing in the direction of castling queen side. Now, c3 allows a very interesting idea. So when I see the move c3, the first thing I notice, and I know a lot of you are probably tempted to play a5 here, if I'm reading the room correctly. But when I see the move c3, the first thing I notice is that the pawn on d3 has been weakened. Now, that might not seem relevant because black cannot attack that pawn with the pieces but black you know attacking a pawn with pieces isn't the only way to exploit a weak pawn we can also use our own pawns to undermine our opponent's pawn structure so what move does that suggest what move does that suggest yeah the move that it suggests is c4 but i think that before we play c4 it's worthwhile to take on c3 because if we had played c4 immediately, as you can see, it would have potentially dropped, would have potentially dropped the b4 pawn. Now we play c4 with a clean conscience, and I already think that white is in a little bit of trouble in the center. Notice how nicely our minor pieces are all positioned. The queen is protecting c4, the bishop and the knight are both aiming at e4. They used to be biting on granite, but now what they're doing makes a lot of sense, because the d3 pawn is now incredibly weak. If white's pawn could shift back to c2, all of white's problems would be solved. That is the power of pawn chains and the potential danger of reducing the size of your pawn chain. They become easier to undermine. Knight g5, a good way to protect, preemptively protect the pawn on e4. But it allows us uh, the possibility of continuing to put pressure on white's center. Right? That's what we tried to do with the move c4. So we should try to be consecutive here. What seems to be a natural follow-up to the move c4. And don't rush to take the pawn on d3, right? That, that should not be something that you're doing automatically. A lot of you are saying d5. d5 is bad because it allows white to play e5 and close down the center. That has the opposite effect. The move is knight c5. Exactly. You're bringing the knight into the game. You're putting more pressure on d3. You're actually threatening now to capture the pawn. And if the d3 pawn moves, then we can take on e4. A classic way to force white's hand. And already you can see how much pressure we're putting on white's position. White is a lot more space. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll talk about this after the game. The reason I, did, I don't take on d3 first is because it allows white's queen to get into the action. If you take first and play knight c5, yeah, you're playing knight c5 with tempo. And so a lot of you guys are succumbing to one move itis. You're saying, oh, I play knight c5 and I attack the queen. But the queen simply steps back to c2. And you have reduced the number of white's targets from two to one, right? The pawn on d3 is itself a target. You shouldn't rush to take it. And this creates an ultimatum where, yeah, white can play dc and conserve his pawns, but after we take on e4, white's, white has the short end of the stick in all regards. He's lost the center pawn, and white, white remains with a very, very bad pawn structure on the queen side. So this is a good example of being patient and evaluating all of your options rather than just reducing the tension immediately and making the tempting move. Yes, yeah, Charlie would say bishop on b7 definitely qualifies as a Naradinsky super shooter, and we've actually gotten our opponent to think for the first time this game, which is a pretty good sign. Morochi says, but what if the center opens and our king is still not castled? So a lot of people have this fear of keeping the king in the center. I've talked about this before. When you hit like intermediate level, you need to be comfortable in certain situations actually not castling at all. You are allowed to keep your king in the center. It is not against the rules of chess. So if the center is closed and you feel that both flanks are dangerous, 
the lesser evil actually might be keeping the king in the center. Now, that has the downside of not connecting your rooks, right? As long as your king is in the center, the rooks are disconnected, but that's not necessarily, you know, mission critical to the position. E5. Okay, so now things get fun. White tries to open up the center. This position is all about order of operations. We just need to figure out what should we do first? What should we capture first? So we essentially have two options. We can play bishop takes g2, or we can play d takes e5 first. We want to weigh the pros and cons of each option. So to me, the tempting move seems to be bishop takes g2, because that reduces the bishop tension. So bishop takes g2, if white plays e takes f6, then we can simply take the rook on f1. And at the end, we're up in exchange. So that's basically a no-brainer. Let's take on g2 first. Let's eliminate the headache of having to worry about the bishops. And now let's think. So now the options, again, are as follows. We can play c takes d3 and take that pawn attack in the knight. Or we can play d takes e5. So if we play d takes e5, white's going to play f takes e5. And then if we grab that pawn with a queen, I will be worried about the placement of the queen in that position. White also has the fork, d4. Now after d4, the line does not end. Who can tell me how black can salvage the piece in that position? After takes, 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 and d4. Yeah, you can give a check on d5, but the king drops back to g1, and that queen on d5 worries me. I feel like that queen is not optimally placed because it's... Uh, subject to potentially annoying moves such as knight f4, although knight f4 does hang the knight on g5. So honestly, this does seem like a pretty darn good option, but I much prefer the option of taking on d3, actually. I think this is much, much better. I'm almost certain of it because this is simpler. This is simpler, and it keeps our center intact. Essentially, after e takes f6, we can just play d takes e2. And after queen takes e2, we take back on f6. We are still up a pawn, but we still have this pawn mess in the center that keeps our king very, very safe. White, on the other hand, yeah, has a pawn mess around their king, but that's a lot more attackable because the g-file is going to be open. So let's play d d2. Yeah, so we should seriously consider after queen takes e2 the, pros the possibility of taking on f6 with the bishop. Taking on f6 with the bishop has the benefit of attacking c3. It also has the benefit of, quote-unquote, keeping your pawn structure intact on the king's side. But remember, you are not just trying to, you know, in, in the Sicilian, the priority is rarely to keep your pawns as intact as possible. Very often, if you're a Sicilian player, you should know this. Very often, this pawn formation, which arises frequently in the Rouser or the classical Sicilian, which I've played in Blitz, is actually better than this pawn formation. Shifting the pawn from g7 to f6 in a way actually improves the health of black's pawn structure. There's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that more pawns equals more safety to the king, right? The king is just safer surrounded by pawns. The second thing is that it opens the g-file. And in this particular instance, we can actually use the g-file as a direct avenue to white's king. But the third thing is that when pawns are doubled, and I've explained this before, you can use the, the pawn that's in front can be used as either a battering ram. You can basically push it without compromising your king's safety, right? You basically have this free pawn that you can push and do stuff with, and you don't have to worry about opening up your king because you have another pawn that stands behind it. So in this case, what move am I talking about? This is a positional move. It's a positional move. It sets up an outpost. It sets up an outpost. We play the move f5. We set up the outpost on e4 for the knight. Now you might say, well, didn't I just say that we can use the g file? Rook g8 is not going anywhere, right? We can play rook g8 on the next move. We're sort of masking our intentions on the king side. We're saving rook g8 for a rainy day. f5 is a really, really strong move. And this is why it's better to take with a pawn on f6. Can't the knight come back to g5? It absolutely can. Maybe it even will. But... We can chase the knight away with f6, or we can simply eliminate the knight with our bishop. We can play bishop takes g5. Or we have many other options, actually. We can go d5 and knight e4, really cementing that outpost. Okay, bishop b3. So knight g5 is not scary. Okay, now we do not want to allow our knight to get exchanged. So this is a no-brainer. We want to play knight e4. We certainly do not want to allow bishop takes c5. Bishop d4, well, that forces our hand. And we are more than happy to have our hand forced rook g8. And look at this. 
The pressure on G3 has already grown totally unbearable. White is losing. We have so many things that we can do in the subsequent position. And uh, knight G5. Okay, this is desperation. How should we proceed? And this is easy. At this point, it's just kind of like letting your hand make the moves. No, come on, guys. Come on. F6, knight takes C4. Don't forget, the knights are staring at each other. No, you just play bishop takes g5. Don't overthink it. Bishop takes g5 and rook takes g5. And we're crashing through and attacking g3. This is already essentially resignable. This is already essentially resignable. Um, yeah, rook takes g5. Now, we still need to be careful because our king is not the safest. So we cannot relax. Yeah, now I think a lot of you are already seeing the move. If I'm reading this correctly, I think most of you are going to be thinking one of two moves. Either h4, attacking the g3 pawn, or the move d5. But d5 is stronger because d5 improves the position of our knight. It, it, it cements the knight in place. And it opens up the queen, which somebody decided to put on c7, and it attacks g3. And the move h4 is going to be even stronger once the queen is participating in the action. So this is just totally unbearable pressure. Not to mention that white is down already two pawns. So you can see how nicely our setup came together in this game. Yeah, queen e1. Okay, well, I've already revealed the move. It's time to step on the gas pedal and just disappear the pawn on g3. Now, you might ask, why not f4? f4 was also possible, but... I want the pawn to remain on f5 in order to ensure the long-term safety of the knight on e4. I don't want to allow any shenanigans in case one of the pawns has to remove itself. The other one is going to do the, do the, do the honors. My guess is that he's going to... Okay, bishop, bishop e3. Okay, so there comes a time in games like this when you win a bunch of material... And then the absolute simplest method in such positions is simplification. Right? People forget how effective the method of simplification can be. It essentially eliminates the need to calculate variations. In many cases, simplifying is a total no-brainer, as it is here. Just play rook takes g3. After rook takes g3, don't even think about it. You are up three pawns. You're up three pawns. You have a monster knight on e4. The simplest by far is just to play queen takes g3. I don't care if it's the top computer move. It doesn't matter. You know it wins. And so you should play it. And of course, h takes g3 to set up a passed pawn. Knight takes g3 would have been a lot worse. We don't want to move our knight away from the outpost unless we strictly need to. Now, you might look at this and say, wait a second. Isn't it annoying to give white a passed pawn on h3? And understanding that the answer to that question is no just comes from experience, right? This pawn is a very, very long way away from promotion. By the time it even reaches h5, we're already going to be steamrolling white in the center. Okay, so several ways that we can win this position. What I notice when I see this position is two things. The first is that our priority is to set these pawns in motion. How do we set them in motion? Well, we should play f6, f6 and e5 at some point. But before we play f6 and e5, we haven't completed the mission-critical process of activating all of our pieces. Let's start with a patient move rook c8, attack c3, if white allows us to take on c3, we'll take it. If he doesn't, then maybe we'll play f6 and e5. But having the rook already active will help us uh, more effectively set our center pawns in motion. Again, patient. Patience is very important in these positions. And we don't need more pawns. Remember the, the, the idea of diminishing returns when it comes to material. With every pawn or equivalent that you capture, the value of subsequent material that you capture diminishes. And at some point, the curve really drops off. When you're already up a piece, taking another piece is usually, okay, it's good, but taking that first piece was incomparably more important to the evaluation. What should we do now? Well, now we've got a, a very vast choice. Now, going into minor piece endgames in such situations is generally inadvisable. Of course, rook takes c3 is completely winning. Oh, actually, it's so winning that we can play it. But I actually like... Uh, well, now rook takes c3 is easy, though. Yeah, 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 rook, no, rook c3 is easy. Now, I would hesitate to play this move if, if, if white's h-pawn were, let's say, already on h5, right? If the h-pawn constituted a clear and present danger, we would have hesitated. But here, the h-pawn is way, way, way back, and we're fine. How should we win this? Well, ideally, we should win this without giving up the g3-pawn. Can we avoid giving the g3-pawn up? No. No. 
But can we use it as a bargaining chip? We can say, okay, I'm going to give that pawn up, but you're going to have to let me get into a pawn end game. How do we do that? Yeah, we can either drop the knight back to e4, or we can move the knight into e2. Either move is completely winning. Knight e4 is more clinical because the knight is on a defended square. And now we resort to, we return to our old plan. What was our old plan? Well, we play f6, we play e5, and then d4, and the pawns are going to totally overwhelm white's pieces. The game is over. And, okay, here we don't even have to play f6. We can just straight away play e5. Okay, we can just choose which pawn to push. I think d4 is easier because that pawn is literally unstoppable. d3 and d2 coming. Yeah, resigns. I think white's going to resign any second. Yeah, so here if you want to be like, if you want to be like super clinical, what should you play? If you want to be Magnus Carlsen level surgical precision. Not, why f6? f6 is a completely unnecessary move here. The move has to make sense. f4. f4 cuts off the bishop. A common technique, you build up a pawn chain to prevent the bishop from controlling one of the key squares near the promotion line. The bishop is trapped, d3, d2 is coming, and the h pawn is way too slow. It's one tempo too slow, actually, because bishop g7, d2, h6, d1, h7, you might say, wait a second, we can't stop the pawn. But obviously you can checkmate the white king, right? You have a tempo there. Yeah, d2. This is actually going to happen. Now, after h6, if you're worried about h7, you can always play knight e4 to g5. Very nice. That was a nice game. All right, so there's a couple of things to unpack. So if you're a Sicilian player, you need to know what you're going to do against knight c3. A lot of players who are inexperienced in the Sicilian or who just get started, let's say you're a knight or a player, right? And for those who don't know, the knight or Sicilian goes d6, d4. This is called the open Sicilian. It is white's main line. Takes, takes, knight f6, knight c3. Now there are four major Sicilians in this position. There's the knight or that's the move a6. There's the classical or the rouser. I mentioned it. That's the move knight c6. Who can name the other two major Sicilians here? There's a couple of minor lines, but only two major lines. The one is the dragon g6. What's the other one? Not the con. Let's see who knows the other one. The other one is the least popular of the big four. E6, that's the Schwenningen. Very good. This used to be one of the most popular moves. Nowadays, it's almost out of practice. Um, it's totally out of fashion. But it's still a legitimate move. Ray Robson actually was a big Schwenningen guy a couple years ago. Um, I think named after a city in, in the Netherlands. There is also Bishop D7. And there's the Kottenauer variation, which is E5. But E5 is bad because a bishop b5 check. That's actually why you play a6. You play a6 to prepare e5 and to take away the b5 square. How come it's no longer in fashion? The reason it's no longer in fashion is owes, owes itself to Paul Karras, who developed the Karras variation, which is g2, g4. And I think nowadays this is considered to be a very, very dangerous line for black. It's not losing. It's not losing, but it's dangerous. Black is in some trouble in this line. So by keeping the pawn on e7, you're delaying g4. Um, and Karras was, this is called the Karras attack, g4. Anyways, anyways, anyways. Um, let's say that you're a knight or a flare. And let's say that your opponent goes knight c3. Now, the problem with being a knight or a flare and playing the move e6 is that white can now say, tricked you, play knight f3, and then play d4 on the next move. And you have been move ordered into either a con Sicilian or a Taimanov. Or, or I guess a Shevenengen, but not a Nidorf, because in the Nidorf, the pawn remains on e7. So the classic advice for Nidorf players is to play the move d6 here. Because now if white goes knight f3, we go knight f6, and we're chilling. d4, you take and go a6. Um, if you are a Sveshnikov player, or you're an accelerated dragon player, <clears throat> you are recommended to play knight c6. Because after knight f3, you can play the accelerated with g6. Or you can play, you know, the time. If you're a time out of player, you can basically play anything you want. Hopefully that makes sense. So based on which Sicilian you play against knight f3, that in turn determines your line against knight c3. Um, it's like three different freeway exits. And you take one depending on which Sicilian you play. Uh, no, the immediate g6 is fine. Uh, Fedese have actually played this against me in a classical game. Yeah, the immediate g6 is fine as long as you're okay playing a dragon. 
in fact, against Vladimir, I played Knight F3 and D4 because he wasn't a Dragon player at the time. But it turns out that he had prepared it for the tournament. So if you're a Dragon player, you can play G6. Yeah, absolutely. So A6 is a good move if you're a Knight Orf or uh, Khan or, pa or um, Taimanov player. Because here, or a Knight Orf player, if White plays Knight F3 and you're a Knight Orf player, what should you play? Interesting question for you guys. If you play the Knight Orf Sicilian, and even somebody who doesn't play the Knight Orf can answer this question. How should Black proceed if you're a Knight Orf player here? You should play D6. But not Knight F6, because that allows, ooh, there's a bug, that allows the nasty E5. Let me close the window. So here you want to play D6 if you're a Knight Orf player. Um, and if you're a con player, you should play E6. Now, of course, what I have left out is that most of the time that people go Knight C3, they actually do not go Knight F3 on the next move. They play one of two openings. Either the closed Sicilian way of life, which is G3, very popular in the 70s and 80s, still a reputable variation, or as most of you have heard of, the Grand Prix attack where you play Knight C3 and F4. Now, I've played the Grand Prix with White in the speeder, and I won't get into the theory of those openings, just remember, you should have a line against knight c3 if you're a Sicilian player. So we played a6. White indeed played the closed Sicilian with g3. Now we expand with b5. And a3 already, I think, is unnecessary. Classic example of an automatic move. But in reality, I think b4 is not a dangerous prospect because black's just pushing pawns and not developing any pieces. Let's put it this way. I would not have played b4 in this position. We would have played bishop b7 anyway. So a3 is a little bit timid. It's not terrible, but it's a little timid. It gives us a tempo. So bishop g2, d6. And the reason this is called the closed Sicilian is because white does not play d2, d4, which is the open Sicilian. The reason it's the open Sicilian is because the center gets opened. In the closed Sicilian, you normally keep the pawn on d3, and you get this closed center structure where generally black attacks on the queen side and white attacks on the king side. Um... So d3 was, was played. We played e6. There's still a couple, couple games in the database. f4. Knight f6. Um, knight f3. Bishop e7. Still four games in the database. Castles. Now knight c6 I see has been played twi twice, but I don't really like this move. Um, in these positions, I prefer to keep the knight on d7, um, as I explained, because it does not obstruct the bishop. We want the bishops to be staring at each other. We don't put that knight on c6 to be in the way. Um, so this is similar to a hedgehog setup. Yeah, you can definitely draw that parallel. The hedgehog setup in its classical uh, instantiation goes... Okay, you can get the hedgehog through a gazillion different move orders. But for example, you can get um, a hedgehog through this line, which is an English line. Rick e1, castles, e4, d6, d4, cd, knight d4. And, uh, ooh, a6 actually blunders to e5. Um, but, okay, whatever. It, it doesn't matter. I can just... Basically, this is the hedgehog. This is the hedgehog setup, where you have the shenanigan pawns on e6 and d6. But here, you have the pawns on b6 and a6. We have our pawns on b5 and c5. So I would say the setup that we adopted is more active than the hedgehog. But it also is a little bit riskier because we have more space. Okay, so h3. Obviously, white prepares to expand on the king side with g4. Now, maybe it would have been more consistent here for me to play h5 immediately. But we decided to start with queen c7. Now, what would I have done in response to the move g4? Honestly, I was fearing g4 a lot more than what he played. Well, after g4, I think black has a couple of options. We can play the move h6. And the point of h6 is not to stop g5. We, we can't stop g5. The point is to take the sting out of that move. Why does h6 take the sting out of g5? Because if white plays g5, we take it. White takes back with the f1. And as a result of that move, who can tell me what square in the center has been weakened by white? And this square, in turn, can be occupied by one of black's minor pieces. It opens the f file, but we don't give a damn about this open file. The knight's going to jump into e5 in due time, and that's going to be one monster of a knight. So, like, white weakens his control over the key central squares, e5 and d4. So we would have probably responded with h6. Now, here, our opponent uh, carried out this maneuver in the game, knight e2, knight g3, but he did it one move too quickly. I think here, knight e2 would have been a lot more effective. And it's quite possible that black should castle queenside. Um, I'm not totally sure what black should do here. It's a complicated position. 
Um, I've also seen people try to sacrifice on the king side with the move g5, but it's definitely too early for that. I would say that white is slightly better here. I would prefer white. So the setup that we adopted is definitely dubious. It's like, okay, it's it's a little bit iffy, but it can really pay off in a big way if white is not precise, which is what happened here. Maybe we can also just castle, right? And if white plays g5, we can still go knight h5, and we can then secure that knight with a move g6. But I don't like this as much. I feel like that knight on h5 is going to get in trouble in the end. So in any case, at any rate, white plays knight e2, giving us the opportunity to prevent g4. h5, a4, we play b4. And I actually think c3 is a very serious... I think it's one step in the right direction, or wrong direction. And after bc, I think it was critical for white to play knight takes c3, actually. I think after bc and c4, we're clearly better already. Because white's center is just collapsing. White's entire center is collapsing. In contrast, knight takes c3 would have kept the white center intact because the move c4 is no longer as effective. Why is it no longer as effective? Because the knight from c3 defends the pawn on e4, which means that let's say white plays the same move from the game, knight g5. If we play the same move that we played, which is knight c5, now white can simply play dc. Now white can simply play dc. So contrast this position to this position. The knight on e2 does not defend e4. And so this pawn is a lot more poorly defended. How would I respond to f5? Asks scour power. Well, I assume you mean like here, if f5. Well, what are the options for responding to f5? I think e5 is a great move, just closing the center. Nothing wrong with the move e5. Or, or we could play... Well, castling would be very risky because now white has this move knight g5 and this is super, super nasty. This actually loses material. So actually we would play e5. That, that would be what we would do. e5. e5 and then maybe even d5 to reopen the center in, on our terms. So it's very, very nice to have this bishop and to have this knight because now we're going to play the move d5. And we are going to break up white's pawn chain and create weaknesses, for example, on f5. The knight on e2 is also very, very bad. Notice how it's restricted by the pawn on e5. There's no access to any of these squares. Nor does it have access to the g3 square because white can't play g4 because we prevented it by playing h5. So f5 is not scary. c3, b, c, b, c, c4. Knight g5 and knight c5. And after e5, I think e5 is almost a decisive mistake. What should white have done here? Probably dc was the lesser evil. But... If you look at this position, or maybe bishop takes e4, but even knight takes e4, we can cement that knight by playing f5. White's pawns are weak, the g3 pawn's weak. White's in trouble here. This is a very nasty position. This is a very nasty position. Or we could play bishop takes e4 to trade, to trade uh, the pieces. I'm sure the engine probably will find some way to stay alive. Um, but after e5, we, we simply win a pawn and we destroy... White center, and we open up the G file, and we get ourselves the E4, of course. We just get all these advantages. Jelly asks, why did you trade the light squared bishops when white had white squared weaknesses? Well, I don't really think white had light squared weaknesses, though, right? I think the point of trading light squared bishops is just to weaken white's king. Right now, the king's safety is more important than any square complexes, precisely because I already know that I'm going to get the G file, and I already know that I'm going to get the E4 square. So removing the bishop from G2 ensures that white's king is going to be all alone. There's going to be no additional help in protecting G3. So there was a question about why is knight E4 such a dangerous idea if white can just retreat the knight back to D2 and challenge the knight E4? Two reasons. So reason number one is that if we already play rook G8, the pawn on G3 is going to be hanging. White's not going to have time to play knight D2. What if white would have played knight d2 here? Well, black has many ways to respond to this. First, we can play d5. And the knight is replaced by a pawn. Now, is the pawn as good as the knight? No, but it's still a pretty freaking sexy pawn. It's passed, it's protected. So the outpost is replaced by a pawn, a common idea. Or the outpost can be replaced by another piece. We can play the move queen c6 to support the knight. And now the knight is replaced by a queen. The queen's also pretty darn good here. So, or if you don't want any of that, you can just gobble up the pawn on c3. Nothing wrong with taking a free pawn. 
So logistically, knight d2 is just not scary for many, many reasons. My move would be knight takes c3. Yeah, I think knight c3 is best. Now, you would have to be a little bit careful here because white is threatening rook c1, right? You, you have to be careful not to lose your knight. Bishop d4 is also a threat. So you can drop the knight back to d5. Not as great of an outpost as e4, but a pretty, pretty good square. You know, again, great square. Rook c1, we can just tuck our queen on d7. Or we can shift it to b7 and x-ray the king, probably even better. So those are the reasons that knight d2 isn't scary. Now, I agree, bishop d4 loses the game on the spot. Right? Bishop d4 literally helps us do what we wanted to do anyway, which is put the rook on g8. Our opponent just lost the threat. And now h4 combined with the threat threats against g3 are totally deadly. The rest of the game is very simple. Takes, 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 d5, h4, etc. We win all the pawns. Uh, so really, if you think about it, the the climax of the game, like the, the key points, lasted for only like 10 moves or so, right? If we, we can say it started around here when we exited the opening. And by move 21, nine moves later, we were already totally dominating. By move 22, exactly 10 moves later, we were completely winning. So it, it's interesting how quickly these things tend to happen in these complicated middle games. Can you quickly talk about how you changed your mind with the Rook exchange at the end? You said it was an easy win, but before you weren't sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I hesitated briefly because essentially you have to be very, very careful, right? Because knights are the worst piece at stopping a passed pawn, right? If you have just a knight and especially a corner pawn, right? The H pawn is the notorious enemy of the knight. So anytime I'm leaving myself with a knight that faces against an H pawn, I'm just naturally hesitant. But in this particular instance, the king is so close to the pawn that it doesn't matter what you have. Like it doesn't, you don't even need the knight to stop the pawn. You can just park the king on h7. I have an instructive example though of when like my opponent greatly underestimated the importance of not allowing a situation where you basically have a knight trying to stop a fast pawn. So I want to show you guys this example just to conclude the stream. We had this position. White is a pawn down. So my opponent has won a pawn. It's an end game, a pawn down. But something interesting happens here. So I started repeating moves. I went queen c8 check, king f7, and queen c2 check. And I was expecting my opponent to make a draw here. But my opponent decides to play knight back to g6. And this is a huge mistake. Because even though black is up a pawn, black has a knight. The knight is immobilized. And white has a pawn majority on this side of the board. So what I did was drop the bishop back to c3, attacking the pawn on a5. And after the queen moves back to a8 to defend it, I made a very important move. My opponent greatly underestimated the power of this move. It's not a3 before. You can do something a lot better than that. Right? Don't just automatically say, oh, I'm just going to create a pass pawn. That's cumbersome. And that's black and tall, right? That you play a4, you fix the pawn on a dark square. And now all you have to do is basically pre-move queen d2. And the knight is too far away to stop the a5 pawn from falling. My opponent goes queen d5, bang, you play queen d2. And the queen, in the event of a queen shade, black is totally lost. You're gonna take the pawn and the passers are gonna overwhelm the knight. So my opponent goes knight e7. I could have taken the queen here, but I decided to take the pawn first. Now I drop the bishop back to b4. And here it was a no-brainer, trade queens. It's a three on two, black is up a pawn, but this is any, not even close. F5, A6, and now bishop D4 ends the game. Because if knight D4, A7, no forks, E5, bishop takes E5, right? Not even A7, first you take, then we take, and then we come back to D4, and the bishop does absolutely everything. It destroys black's pawn mass, and it promotes the pawns. So, just a, a, a game to hammer home the, the notion that you need to be very, very careful when you leave yourself with only a knight to fight past pawns, especially a corner pawn. But in this case, it's not dangerous, but that is why I hesitated very, very briefly. It's just pure instinct. But again, here you can just put the king on h7 and the king will remain there until the end of days. All right. I think that's where we're going to end. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Have a great start to your Sunday. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.